Good morning, everybody. Toby Tucker, student pastor here at Life Church. I hope you're having a fantastic morning, and I hope that it started off celebrating your dad. Hey, it's Father's Day, and today, dad is going to be part of the focus of our conversation today. Dad truly is an amazing guy, and I'm sure if we pause for a moment, we could all think about some stories that we all have about our fathers. Maybe some funny stories about how dad took out a wasp nest with an airsoft gun and some firecrackers. Or how he stopped up the toilet on Christmas morning and that was the present to everybody in the house. Maybe you have some playful stories about the tea parties or the, the fashion show Barbie that you played with dad or the forts that you built, the Nerf battles that you had, or WrestleMania right in the living room floor. You know, the playful stories. Maybe you have some stories about dad's compassion about how he rescued a perishing puppy from a pool. Or maybe you have that comforting story or those memories about how dad used to walk you to the, the bus stop or to school every morning or how he makes you breakfast in bed. Maybe you have those stories of where he rescued you from a bad relationship or a bully at school. I'm sure we all have those stories about how smart dad is, about he fixed something that nobody else could have fixed. Or maybe you have those love stories where dad's love just poured out for you, maybe your friends, maybe your mom, dad. Yeah, dad has a powerful role in our lives. And throughout scripture, dad is almost always linked with mom in their parental role in our lives. But did you realize that there are some specific things about dad, some truths that are best exposed in the role of a father? Now you will see that these truths and characteristics are not just limited to dad. But often they're true about mom as well. But in the role of a father, you will see that when a dad lives and reflects these characteristics and truths, we can have a beautiful picture into what God is really like. A fantastic photo of the character of God. Now, it's just a picture, and pictures are limited. For example, my daughter has just put a bunch of pictures all up on her wall. You can see it right here. And as she went through and painstakingly put about 150 pictures up on the wall and pinned them and taped them in their perfect places, she would tell me about some of the stories and the people behind these photos. And although the photos were a great representation and reflection of the joy and excitement and relationship she has with these friends, they're just a mere taste. They're just a, a, a mere glimpse into what's true about that event or the emotions or the relationships captured inside of that photo. Photos just give us a glimpse. They give us an image, but it requires a lot more discussion. They are something that can pull us closer to who we're talking about or what we experienced but they are limited. They can never capture the depth of the full exposure to that event or that person. Keep that in mind as we talk about dad today. Our earthly fathers are only an image. They're only a glimpse into who God is. They're extremely limited, just like a photograph. Now, the picture or the understanding of God is made much more clearer the better a father does, the better job a dad does, but it's still only a picture into who God really is. But I think it's a very important glimpse, and it's extremely important for us to look at some of the ways our earthly father can represent and connect us, give us a glimpse into, give us an image of, our Heavenly Father. And today what we're going to do is look at just five truths, five specific truths that our earthly Father can display for us that reflects our Heavenly Father. Now you all remember we're in a series called The Storyteller where we're taking a look at some of Jesus' parables that can connect us with earthly experiences to heavenly realities. And one of the best stories is written in flesh and blood. That is our dad. 
And last week, or the last two talks that we had, we looked at what a good father really looks like. Two sons that were crazy kids, one that ran off and was rebellious, the other one stayed home and was hyper-religious, and the tension and the arguments and the strife it caused inside of the home. Yet the good father was able to navigate it in a way of grace and mercy that had a gravity that just pulls us in. And as we start to look at God today, keep in mind the character, the attitude, and the actions of the good father, whether working with the rebellious son or the religious son. His love, compassion, grace, and mercy were almost impossible to resist. Now, just before we walk into this conversation about dad today, I want to reflect and be respectful to the fact that even though the word father to me is an awesome word, I have awesome memories with my dad. I have wonderful experiences with my dad. I've got great role models in my life of what a good dad looks like. I desire to be a good dad. I realize that's not always true for everybody. For some of you, you don't have that relationship with your dad. I say it brings joy and excitement, but for you, it brings tears and terrible memories. And I just wanted to say that being a father is a very challenging thing to, to carry the role as a father. And you'll see these truths today is very challenging. And it can be really easy to reject God, our heavenly father, because of the way we've related to our earthly father. And my encouragement to you is this. Please don't judge our heavenly father. By our earthly father but judge our earthly father by our heavenly father today we will see truths about God that should be active in all fathers in all dads but the reality is even though I desire to be a great dad and I've had a great dad we do fall short because we're humans but the reality is this just because they might not be true of our earthly father it does not mean it's not true of our heavenly father the second group is for those that maybe have never met their father or your father has passed away. And as we have a conversation about dad, it can be, can be very hard. And I don't know what that feels like, but I will say this. As we walk through this conversation, my hope is that you will reel in good memories if, if you have them with your father so that you can connect with some of the images and the ideas. But also look for this through this message is not just one for immediate or, or a present experience, but for a future experience as well. This, this fatherly figure, this dad that we're, we're talking about, the, this earthly picture of our heavenly God, can be something that you think about when you get older. The kind of father you want to be, the kind of dad you want to be, the kind of husband you want to be looking for. It is preparatory for the future as well as focusing on the present. So I give you that encouragement, which is broad. This is all relational, relates to all of us as we walk into this conversation. Our earthly father should be a representation of our heavenly father. So as we walk through and we look at these truths, they're supposed to be true about dad. If dad does them well, it gives us a greater picture of God. It makes sense that if he does it poorly, it gives us a poor view of God. But again, I encourage you, judge your earthly father by your heavenly father, not your heavenly father by your earthly father. Now let's walk into some of these truths about God and how our dad can be a good picture of what he's like. So here we go. One of the ways our earthly father can represent or give us a photograph a picture into our Heavenly Father is by living in a way and developing us when it comes to our direction in life. Dad is part of that, that formula that helps us find our way in life. Through his words and through his wisdom, he teaches us. He teaches us life skills, how to navigate the world and environment around us with success and safety. He also develops in us disciplines Things that we need to do, regiments and routines that are important, that help develop us mentally, physically, spiritually, relationally. Dad is also there to help direct us when it comes to beliefs. What is true? Values, what we think is important. Attitudes, how we expose other people to our beliefs 
in our values and actions. How we navigate this world, the things that we do, the things that we don't do, the places we go, the places we shouldn't go. This is one of the things that dad does for us. He gives us direction. And that makes absolute sense because that's exactly how God functions as well. God is a God of direction. God is fully prepared to give us direction in this world. He has no intentions of us trying to go through this world on our own, trying to navigate this world on our own. He supplies direction for us. First of all, he says to just trust him. He says in Proverbs uh, 3, 5, and 6, Trust me, trust in the Lord with everything about you, with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll make your path straight. God is very clear. You don't have to trust yourself. Trust me. Don't try and find your own pathway. I will develop that pathway for you. And through the presence of the Holy Spirit, God in us, active in our lives, he will help us navigate this world to be safe and successful, to thrive and survive. He doesn't just give us his presence, though, through the Holy Spirit. He also gives us his presence through the Word, the Bible. Scripture tells us in Psalms 119, verse 105, that the Word of God, the, the Bible, is a lamp for our feet so we know where to step and a light into our path so we know we're suppo where we're supposed to go. The Scriptures are one of the clear directional tools for us. 2 Timothy 3 tells us this. It says, all scripture, the Bible, is God-breathed. His very breath, his very direction for us. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God knows how to get you to the ministry he's called you to, to the life that is most abundant for you. And he says, follow me. Follow my prodding as the Holy Spirit and follow the direction I've given you in my spoken word, the Bible. God doesn't want us to just figure out this world on our own. He gives us an earthly father to help us navigate that. But he always is accessible for us and gives us clear direction personally through prayer, through his presence, and through his word. And think about this for just a minute. What if we all followed the directions that God gave us. What would this world look like if fathers instilled and modeled the directions that the Heavenly Father has given to us? What would this world look like? As we look over the directions, the clear directions God has given to all humanity, I can tell you this, all emotional, all relational, all social, all political, all environmental, all moral issues would completely be gone. All sin would be eradicated if we just followed the direction of God. If we followed the directions that God has given to us, all the problems that we face would be gone. What would it be like if fathers modeled that for their kids? What would it be like if kids respected and responded and lived that way as well? God is clear that he gives us direction for this world. Our earthly fathers are supposed to model it because it is a brilliant picture into what our heavenly father looks like. Let's take a look at the next truth that our earthly father can model that reflects our heavenly father. The next truth that our earthly fathers can give us a glimpse of is that of provision. Fathers are called to provide for their kids. Gods are called to provide, Fathers are called to provide for their, their family physically with, with shelter. They're supposed to provide nourishment and food. They're supposed to give safety and education to train them up. And these are all things you need that dad is called to fulfill. And most of the time, dads do these things quite well. And for most people that are listening to this message, dads are doing those things. For example, I doubt very seriously that you're naked, you're starving, you're living in a hole and you're freezing because dad has met those needs that you have. And what's really cool about it, dads often give us a lot of our wants as well. 
the technology that we want, the clothes that we want, the sports that we want to go and play. Dads often fulfill a lot of our wants. And I'm going to tell you, as a dad, we want to do that. We know we have to supply the needs. We desire to give you even more, often even more than you would ask for. This is kind of how the heart of God works as well. God is a providing God, and God is excited to provide for us. In Matthew chapter 7, we get a brilliant picture of what it looks like when we talk to God and ask Him for the things that we need. For example, Jesus is saying, when you're praying, consider these things. Ask, seek, and knock. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. All who ask, receive. All who knock, the door is open. God is so ready to give us whatever we need. Whatever we need. And what's awesome is... He possesses the ability, Scripture says, to give us way more than we would ever ask for. His pocketbook ain't limited like our earthly father's is. God wants to provide. That is often the heart of a father. Whenever we need something, they want to respond. And God says, that's a great picture of how I am. So in the reality of things, if you need something, we can always ask. The next truth or the characteristic of God that our earthly father reflects of our heavenly father is that of protection. Listen, dads are just wired to protect their kids. They're wired to protect their kids in every single angle of that word, whether it's relationally, environmentally, physically, emotionally, financially. Dads are just wired to protect their kids. This is a great image of how God is. God is a protective God. God does tell us that if we need him, he will show up and he will be our defense. As a matter of fact, in Psalm, we read this in Psalm 91. If you go through that passage, God says he shows up as our protector with so many dynamic words. He says, when you need my protection and you call on me, when life ain't going well, when things are challenging and hard, call on me. I will give you rest. I will give you refuge. I will save you. I will cover you and I will shield you. He says, I'll be the barricade. You don't have to have any fear. No fear, no harm, no disaster will come upon you. I am your salvation. God is a protective God. Just like an earthly father will protect his kids, the heavenly father protects his kids. The reality is this. God does not promise us that this world will be all safe and danger free. What he does promise is this, he will be right with us as we walk through the danger. Just a few months back, my little baby son Emmett was having night terrors. He was waking up at night and he was crying, he was afraid and you have to put him in the bed with, with me and Emma and he would just cry himself back to sleep and one of the times he woke back up startled, I could tell that he was afraid. I rolled over and I grabbed him and I looked at him and I said, Baby, invite me into your dream. Daddy will take out that monster because I'm a protective dad. You don't mess with my son. i got to kick that fake monster's butt. That's dad. That's how I'll show up. Invite me in. That is a, a feel that I have that I think God works like that. God's up there and say, Hey, World's messing with you. Emotions are messing with you. Relationships messing with you. Money's got you messed up. Call me into the game. I'm there. I'm ready to respond. I will give you all of the things that I said I would. I will provide the rest. I will give you the refuge. I will make it safe. I will completely cover you. I will shield you and barricade you. Just call on me. Just like we can go to our earthly father for wisdom and direction and protection, we can go to our Heavenly Father for wisdom, protection, and direction. God is a protective God. Never forget that. Because He's protecting you, whether you know it or not. Just like your earthly dad does stuff to protect you you don't know about, so too does your Heavenly Father. The next truth or characteristic that our earthly dad can reflect, that gives us a good glimpse into who our Heavenly Father really is, is the area of correction. And I know that this is a tense spot for a lot because no one likes discipline. But discipline, correction, is one of the primary key roles in a parent's responsibility in raising their children. 
In Proverbs 29 and 15, the Bible warns parents, if you don't discipline your kids, they'll be rotten. If you do not tell them to stop doing bad stuff, they're going to keep doing bad stuff. So a parent's role is to step in and correct and redirect unhealthy activities. Now, when it comes to a dad, the Bible seems to understand the relationship between a dad and a child quite well. In Ephesians 6, there are three quick verses to start off the passage that God says to kids. It says, children, obey your parents. And the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, for this is the first command with a promise that you will have a long and healthy life. The Bible tells us as children that we're supposed to respect and honor our parents, to obey our parents. But right after that, Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. This is a guideline for dads so that they are able to respond to correct their kids in a way that is righteous, right by God's ways, and reflective of God's way of corrective. God is a God that will correct us, and he will discipline us because we are his children. There are things that we choose to do that can be very dangerous for us, and God steps in and will correct us and discipline us when we get on pathways that we shouldn't. And there are different causes and different levels of that discipline, depending on the danger behind the behavior. For example, Emmett has been walking around the house. He can walk now. And he has this plastic spoon. And as he walks around the house, he's hitting everything with the house, everything in the house. There are some things that he's not allowed to hit like his sister so that when he does so when he hits his sister we have to step in with discipline and take it away and say no you cannot do that that's light discipline we're just trying to redirect trying to correct his behavior because it's not acceptable that discipline is mild sometimes it's major because the level of the behavior could lead to much bigger risks and much bigger danger I responded totally different when I saw Emmett with a fork moving towards an outlet. Why? The plastic spoon hitting his sister? It's not that big of a deal. Not really. A fork and a light switch? That's going to light that baby up. Could be very, very damaging to him. So my punishment for that was much more severe. Why? Because I love my son, and I have to discipline and redirect him away from a dangerous behavior. Sometimes that's how God shows up. Maybe we behave or do or say something we shouldn't, and God will show up in a mild redirection to try and get us back into the right pathway. But sometimes the choices we make are very dangerous, and he shows up very intentionally. And he can show up in many different ways. The pressure and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Or he can use our parents to step in and be the physical part of his response. Sometimes God steps in in very aggressive ways. Because he knows things we don't. He knows the danger behind certain behaviors. Just like sometimes our dad has to step in. And he has to do things, say things, take away things. Um, limit certain things because he knows a little bit more than we do. Just like God. Sometimes God doesn't let us have, doesn't let us get, or let us go certain places. Sometimes God has to step in and stop us, correct us, and redirect us, discipline us, because it's dangerous the direction we're going in that relationship, in that behavior in that mindset, God will step in and he will discipline us. And it's important to understand when God does this, it is extremely telling of who he is and who you are. Hebrews tells us in chapter 12, right here, he says, the Lord disciplines the ones that he loves and he chastises everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardships as discipline. God is treating you as his children. Look at this. For what children are not disciplined by their father? 
If God is showing up and correcting and disciplining you, if your dad does that, that's because you're his child. He loves you. He doesn't want the damage and the hurt and the dangers behind whatever is going on. So he stops in and he disciplines. God says that I'm like that. If you're my child, I will discipline you. But this is what's crazy about it. Sometimes people say, I don't feel bad at all about what I'm doing. I don't feel like God's changing anything. That's very honking dangerous. You know why? Because look what verse 8 says. If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline if you're a child, then you are not legitimate. You're not a true son or daughter. If God's not disciplining you, you don't have a relationship with him. Fathers are supposed to discipline their children, just like God disciplines his children. And they do that because they love us. As a dad, I discipline because I love. Listen, are there dads out there that love to punish their kids? Maybe. Maybe there are. But I can tell you this. The heart of God in a dad, a good dad, a good dad does not love to discipline. A good dad disciplines because he loves and he knows that if there is not a change in a redirection, there is damage that he does not want you to ever suffer the pain or the consequences of. Discipline is one of those things that is hard and painful in the moment, but it has something beautiful behind it. Love. Love, which is the last thing we're going to look at today. When it comes to the word love, I chose to go with the word affection, mostly because it just keeps with the shun words. We had direction, protection, provision, correction. Now we have affection. It just kind of fits. But the word affection doesn't quite cover what love is. First of all, when it comes to love and an earthly dad's love for his kids, that's a natural thing, just like protecting your kids. Um, and I think the Bible gets that because the Bible doesn't have to command dads to love their kids. Dads just love their kids. Not all dads do it well, but they love their kids. Just like God loves us, his children. The dynamic behind the love that a father has for his child is, is huge. So what I want to do in this closing point is just unpack a few things about God's love for his children that just reflect the heart of a father. The first one is rather obvious. God's love for us is relational. 1 John 3, verse 1, it says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The first thing about God's love for us as his children is, it is a relational love. We are in a relationship with God. Our lives are entwined and in tune and walk with God. The next flavor to this love is that it is intentional. God loves us on purpose, and he absolutely knows what he's going to get. Remember in the parable of the lost son and the good father, the father knew what he was getting on both sides, a rebellious, wrecked son and a religiously irritating son, but he loved them both. It was in him, intentionally, on purpose, he loved both of them, and that's God's love for us. God loves us knowing what he's going to get in return. God has an, an intentional and personal love for us. The next thing about God's love is it's motivational. 1 John 4, 11 says this, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love others. God's love, because he loves us the way he loves us, it moves us and motivates us and propels us forward to love other people. The way we love others is directly connected with the way we love God. God loves us. We must be better at loving him. The next part of love is, God's love is, it is transformational. 1 John 4.19 says this, We love because he first loved us. God does this amazing work in our ability to love, that once we receive his love through grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, he comes in and changes and completely transforms who we are. And because he is love and he comes in, we now have the capacity to love. We love because he loves. It's transformational love. The next kind of love, it's a love that is sacrificial. 
God would give anything for you. Aaron, Aaron Gibson, a 31-year-old father, was out walking with his children. As they were out walking in the plains of Alaska, they encountered a polar bear. Immediately, the polar bear turned on the family. Aaron turns his kids around. He gave them direction, and he turned around and gave them protection because of his affection, and he chased the bear. Aaron gave his life up that day to protect his kids because he loved his kids, a love that is sacrificial. God's love for us is sacrificial. Just like with Aaron, he would give himself for us. John 3, 16, probably the most famous verse in the world, declares that kind of love. God loved the world, so he gave his one and only son, so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God so loves us and wants a relationship with us and will lavish on us love that he will die for us. That's an intense love, a father's love. The next thing, the final word, is it's a gravitational love. Romans 2 puts it beautifully when it gives flavors of God's love, how his kindness, about how his patience motivates us and moves us and draws us in. It's almost irresistible how much God loves us. It's gravitational. The love that God has for us, the affection that he has for us, is a vivid picture of a father's love. And although our earthly father might not always reflect that, that is what is inside of a good father's heart. A good father gives direction, gives provision, gives protection, gives correction, and gives affection. I hope that that is the kind of experience you're having with your earthly father. That is a vivid picture of the heart of our heavenly father. Today being Father's Day, I encourage you to do two things. The first thing is this. Identify what part of this conversation your dad does really well and go thank him for that. Tell him you see it in him and thank him for that. As a father, that's a bigger Father's Day gift than anything you could possibly buy. And while you're at it, consider your relationship with dad right now. Is there any tension between the two of you? Is there something that you need to ask for forgiveness for from your dad? Is there something that there's a tension between you guys that needs to be removed? I can, I'd ask you to consider removing that today. Just go to dad and tell him that you're done with whatever it is. Apologize, ask for forgiveness for it, and then move forward in that relationship. The second thing is this. Consider your relationship with your Heavenly Father. Where is that relationship? First, if you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, our Savior, I encourage you to inspect Jesus. Start seeking and searching out who Jesus is and why we as Christians believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life, the only access we have to the Father. Consider starting a relationship with God through Jesus Christ today. If you already have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, my encouragement to you is this. Examine your life. See if you're loving him the way he loves you. Look through your life and see if there's anything that may have caused a, a tension between you and your heavenly father. See if there's anything that you need to repent of that you need to give over to God and start following him. With that, I love you guys. I hope you have a fantastic week. Have fun, make wise choices. Toby, out.